And um, I will start by uh, thanking the organizers of the conference for inviting me to give a talk. And I will use this opportunity of giving a talk to, um, to present you with some very recent work, which is really preliminary results that we have obtained in the Bramati group at Laboratoire Kessler Bruxelles in Paris. And uh, this is teamwork and just the voice of a, of a larger team today. And uh, most of the work, in fact, in the laboratory is done by Ferdinand Claude and Thomas Boulier, who is another postdoc in the team. Okay, so the, the talk is on polariton hydrodynamics for rotating analog gravity. So just like Jeff, I am interested in uh, recreating some aspects of black hole physics in the laboratory. But in our case, the black holes uh, rotate. And um, in order to create a rotating black hole, um, I, I will go in depth into that, but basically what we do is that we pump uh, our polaritons with a beam that has some orbital, orbital angular momentum and that induces a rotation in the flow of the polaritons that creates a vortex flow. And what we do is that we move a small defect across the flow. And let me show you a movie of what happens when we have a vortex flow and we move a small defect across the flow. So here it starts. This is all steady state. We are basically moving the cavity. And here is a small defect that I'm following with my mouse. I'll play it a few more times. And what you see basically is that in the wake of the defect, as expected for polaritons, there are some solitons that form. However, those solitons, they do not form exactly in the way which we would expect um, if we had a, a laminar flow of the, of the fluid. So let me show you some screenshots of this experiment, which I just uh, showed a movie of. In some regime, say here, I zoom on it, we have two solitons, and the solitons don't propagate exactly straight. In some other regime, so when the uh, defect, which is marked by the red dot, has moved a little bit across, um, across the vortex, we have only one soliton. I mean, there is some tiny disturbance here, but this is really not a soliton. Here, we have a soliton. And in some other regime, when the uh, defect has moved further out uh, on, the, on the vortex, so very far away from the core or closer to the edge, whichever way you want, there is no more soliton. I mean, there is some dip in the density, but that's not a soliton. So we have three different regimes of soliton propagation on a vortex flow with two, one, and zero solitons. And we see that these regimes depend on basically where the, the defect on, in the wake of which the solitons are created is positioned with respect to the center of the beam or with the respect of the, to the center of the vortex. And the question we ask ourselves then is, okay, so we have this vortex and we have the solitons on it. And how can we understand really the first the, the three different regimes and the trajectories of the solitons in those three different regimes? And what I'm going to present now today to you is basically the blueprint of a systematic study of this question, which is very much serendipity. It was not at all what we wanted to do when we uh, set off on uh, studying analog black holes in the lab. And yet we, we found that this is interesting. So, as I said, this is about analog gravity, so I will give you a short idea of what analog gravity is to begin with. And this basically explains what a black hole is, the curvature of space-time, and terms like event horizon and ergo surface, which I use very much. Okay, so very simply, uh, black holes are objects that are predicted by general relativity. And general relativity identifies gravity with the curvature of space-time, meaning that um, the more compact, the denser, and the more massive an object, the more the space-time that makes the universe uh, will be curved. And we can go from having a small body like the sun to having a, to having a space-time uh, for a black hole, in which case uh, all the mass of the, of the star is basically concentrated in the central singularity, and uh, the, uh, the object is so dense uh, and compact that it curves the space-time such that there is an event horizon that forms. An event horizon is a point of no return. Basically, if uh, light crosses or so someone cannot signal from inside the event horizon to the outside. And we've been able to calculate uh, numerically uh, what, uh, how, how, the, how a rotating black hole would deform light, uh, bend light for a very long time since the, since the 1970s. And very recently, we've also been able to observe uh, this effect in, uh, from a real black hole from another galaxy, which is very, very exciting. Okay, so 
black holes basically are defined by their event horizon. And how can we understand what this event horizon really is? Um, there is a very nice way to do that. And it's from a metaphor that was first drawn by Bill Unruh, again, in the 1970s, as he was giving a seminar at Oxford. And this metaphor um, of, uh, that, that, that allows us to understand the black hole is, is very simple. So basically, what we do is that we consider the black hole, the Schwarzschild black hole, that's a non-rotating uh, spheric black hole, in the Pinlevé Gulstrand coordinates. They are different from the coordinates which everyone is used to, uh, in that they are stationary. And in these coordinates, there is an event horizon, basically, um, when this term beta here, which is the escape velocity, equals the speed of light. What does that really mean? Well, it's very, very simple. If you picture a river that's flowing towards a waterfall, towards a cascade, as the river goes closer to the cascade, the flow velocity of the river increases. And now if you picture fish in that river, that's, that swim at a constant velocity, they will have very different kinematic regimes as a function of where they are on the river with respect to the cascade. Very far away upstream, it will be easy for the fish to go back and forth, but the closer they get to the cascade and the faster the water flows, and so the more difficult it becomes for them to swim back upstream. And there comes a point at which the flow velocity of the water downstream and the maximum speed of the fish swimming upstream is exactly equal. If the fish swims a tiny bit further downstream, it will be unable to come back because it will be unable to overcome the flow velocity of the water. So that point, this point of no return for the fish on the cascade is analogous to an event horizon. And um, I think as Jeff demonstrated in his experiments, uh, if you replace uh, the water with a superfluid and if you replace the fish uh, with sound, you can get exactly the same picture, uh, which is then called a dumb hole or a death hole. And that was uh, explicitly shown in, uh, in a work by Bill Unruh in 1981. So from this, we understand the event horizon as the point of no return. And that's for a black hole that's non-rotating. Now, a black hole that rotates is slightly more complicated. So the sort of a simpler black hole that rotates is the non-charged black hole that's also uh, spheric and uh, it's called the Kerr black hole. And here I, I write it in boyer lindquist coordinates because it's uh, simpler to understand. And again, uh, in that, uh, that rotating black hole has an event horizon and it also has another static surface, another static limit, which is called the ergo surface. I show it here in orange. It's further out from the center of the black hole. That static limit is the limit uh, which a particle cannot cross and remain at rest with respect to an observer at infinity. So if I have an observer sitting here, any particle inside the ergo surface, so in the ergo region, cannot remain at rest with respect to me. And then if the particle crosses the event horizon, it falls in the black hole interior. So rotating black holes have, have two surfaces, the ergo surface, the surface and the horizon. Now, it's also possible to create um, rotating um, flows in the laboratory. So the question is how similar are those rotating flows to actual curved space time with rotation? So how similar, for example, is um, a draining bathtub uh, to, a, to a care black hole? And this question has been very widely studied. There are very many references. I just put two at the bottom of the screen. But basically consider the draining bathtub flow which has the following velocity profile here at the top of the screen. And it's basically characterized by its drain D and its uh, circulation. And um, the draining bathtub flow can be written also in terms of uh, boyer lindquist coordinates. And just below, I write again the Kerr coordinates uh, or the, the Kerr space-time for you to see how analogous the two notations are. So there is, there is really a one-to-one -one correspondence almost. And from this uh, correspondence, it's very easy for the draining bathtub flow to identify an ergo surface where the local total flow velocity of the water equals the flow veloc the velocity of uh, waves, say surface waves, as well as an event horizon where the radial flow velocity of the water equals the velocity of waves. So we can, in the laboratory, by having a very still bathtub and opening it such that it drains, create something, a space-time, which has an ergo surface and an, an event horizon. So we can create um, an analog an analog to a rotating black hole in the laboratory. Now the question is, what happens to waves on this uh, analog rotating black hole? I will stick to the, to the water 
uh, draining bathtub flow for now, and then we will move to the polar atoms. So here on the left, for you, I plot the flow velocity of the water on the draining bathtub flow. And on the right, I calculate uh, what happens to a wave front that propagates from the right to the left across this flow. And what I do is that I treat uh, each point along the, the wave front um, as a ray. And it's shown in uh, very many works, but mostly in uh, Theodore's PhD thesis, that this is very good uh, and in very good agreement with the experiments. So I have all those rays, okay? And as a function of the starting position of the ray, they will propagate differently across the vortex flow. So basically the rays on top here, they are in the same direction as the flow. All the, ray, all the red rays, we call co-propagating rays. On the other hand, the counter-propagating rays, they go against the flow. And we see that they have uh, very different behaviors. Basically the, the red rays, the co-propagating co rays, they curl under the influence of the flow until this last stable orbit here, which marks the ergo surface of the black hole. The counter-propagating rays, they just are deflected in a bit, a bit like uh, they would be by lens, for example. So that's a bit analogous to gravitational lensing. There is also an entire family of rays that falls straight inside the black hole, inside the ergo surface, and onto the horizon. Okay, so we can calculate analytically here uh, the propagation of a wave front. And in fact, it, find, it, it so happens, as I said, that uh, these calculations, they match very well what happens in the experiment. So here, is a very good experiment by the Weinfurtner group that was led by uh, Theo Torres in 2017, which shows the deformation of a, left, of, the, of a wave front that's propagating from the right to the left across the vortex flow. And we see how the wave front is deformed as it propagates and how some waves are, um, or some bits of the wave front are taken onto the ergo surface where they reflect. And some of them, if they come with the right uh, frequency, reflect with a coefficient that is higher than one, implying that their energy has been amplified by an effect that is called rotational superradiance. That's an effect that was predicted by uh, Zeldovich um, for rotating black holes and rotating bodies in general. And it so happens that we can also observe it in the, in the laboratory. And as Jeff also showed, it's possible to observe effects like Hawking radiation. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that not only can we recreate uh, the motion of waves on curved spacetime in the laboratory, but we can also observe effects of this curved spacetime, of this effectively curved spacetime on the waves in the laboratory. And we can observe super, super radiance, the Hawking effect, and many other effects. And this is what motivated us here in Paris um, to look into this, because it's quite easy to create an analog rotating black hole with polaritons. So, because it's a polariton uh, conference and I'm almost the last one to speak, I don't think I need to introduce polaritons much, but basically what we have is a strong laser beam that pumps uh, semiconductor, uh, that pumps semiconductor quantum wells inside a micro cavity. What we do in the, in the Paris group is that we, uh, we pump quasi-resonantly with continuous excitation. Quasi-resonantly means that we have a slight detuning between the pump and the lower polariton branch uh, that's created inside, uh, inside the micro cavity. And the wave function of the polaritons that we create uh, with our pumping scheme is a modified gross pitaisky equation with those two additional terms that are the driven dissipative na nature of our system. And the fact that we have a modified gross pitaisky equation implies that the polaritons behave really as a superfluid in some conditions in our experiment. And there is much more to be said about this. So what I say, so just stay tuned and go to Ferdinand's, close, Ferdinand's talk later this afternoon. He will say much more about all of this. So we have a superfluid of polaritons and we can make it rotate. It's very easy to make it rotate. As I said earlier, when I showed you the movie, we pump uh, the, the polaritons with a Lagergos beam. That's also quasi resonant and continuous. Uh, Lagergos beam has, a, has this very nice donut shape here. So this is a Lagergos beam with a, a number of 20. So that's a very high uh, LG number. And that induces a rotation in the flow. And the rotation in the flow we can see, for example, by looking at the phase um, of, of, the, of, the, of, the flow, of the fluid. What's very important to note here is that, yes, we have a driven dissipative system, but we do not have here at the center of our system, 
um, a hole by which the polaritons would uh, would go out of the system. Instead, we have uh, we have polaritons going out everywhere. So our vortex flow is not the draining bathtub flow. And this asks the question: Okay, since we do not have the draining bathtub flow, how much of the analogy to um, to the care space time to the rotating black hole remains? Because the care space time describes a black hole with a central singularity where everything falls in. So do we still have an event horizon? And uh, do we still have an ergo surface in our rotating flow? So what I do to answer this question is that I use a numerical code um, to simulate really the gross Pitet scale equation. Here is a steady state image of the density. And I uh, look at a cross, uh, sorry, a, radial, uh, a radial cut in the density, and I look at the various velocities. So in black here on the left hand side, I plot the total velocity of the polaritons, um, the total velocity, yes, in, uh, and, in, and in pink, I plot uh, the radial velocity. In red, I also plot the sound velocity, which is basically the uh, square root of the density. And what we see is that at some point, the total velocity equals the speed of sound. As we said earlier for the draining bathtub flow, well, when the total velocity equals the speed of waves, we have an ergo surface. And there is also a point where the radial velocity equals the speed of sound, and there we have an event horizon. So although we do not have a draining bathtub flow, we still have those two limits, those two boundaries in our space time. So we have effectively created a rotating space time with an ergo surface and inside of it, an event horizon. Now the question is, uh, what happens to, uh, you know, to waves on this rotating space time? And um, we cannot run the very nice experiments that Theodor has run in, in Nottingham. Instead, uh, what we can do at the moment is that we can study it uh, analytically. So here, it how it is, here is how it goes. I uh, also consider the congruence of rays on the vortex flow. And um, my rays, they are phonon-like, OK? So they are uh, low-k uh, Bogolubov excitations. So the, the relation dispersion is omega equals uh, ck with c the speed of sound. And I treat the trajectories of those phonons, if I may say so, with iconal optics. So essentially, they are freely falling particles that I launch uh, with the local velocity of the, of the flow. And all the rays originate from the same, uh, from the same uh, point a, a tiny bit above the horizon. And what I do is that I just solve the Hamilton-Jacobi equations. So here is um, a detail of this complicated figure. We see that um, when we are a bit far from, from the horizon inside the ergo surface, uh, the phonons, they may still escape and go out the ergo surface if we give them enough time. But as soon as we come closer to the horizon, all phonons fall inside and then they curl up around uh, the vortex core. And then, okay, if we go out again further, um, the phonons uh, are again able to escape. Uh, so they do not meet the horizon and they are able to escape from the ergo surface. And this gives us this collection of trajectories. So that's nice because so far, everything is just as expected. This is Hamiltonian mechanics and it works. Uh, so that's good. And uh, what we learn is that we have a rotating space time, an ergo surface, and an ergo region within, and an event horizon, and we can calculate the trajectories of phonons. So we can use that perhaps to study our, uh, our solitons. Because yes, we want to go back to what I showed you earlier. I want to explain this nice movie, which I showed in the beginning. So in this movie, we had our rotating space time. And on this rotating space time, we had a defect that moved across the space time. And in the wake of that defect, dark solitons were generated. So dark solitons, they are um, density dips that are characterized by a pi phase shift, okay? And they propagate in the wake, or they are generated in the wake of, uh, of a defect, and they propagate with an angle that's inside the Cherenkov cone. For what follows, I will consider that they propagate with an angle that's exactly the Cherenkov cone. And if you want to learn much more about how to um, how to generate solitons and how to uh, tune their propagation and so on. You also go to Ferdinand's talk later. He will say a lot about this. So here is a numerical, a numerical integration of our analytical formula for the propagation of solitons. And again, 
the same. We treat, we consider this, the solitons uh, are uh, starting off at the Cherenkov angle. And then we basically consider the propagation of phonons starting off at the Cherenkov angle in the wake of a defect. And we look at their respective trajectories. So I give you the details. When the defect uh, creates a chunk of cone that's very large, such that uh, phonons propagating along the chunk of cone um, can go out of the ergo surface, they do. All these images here are steady state images after 120 microseconds. So we see that if we are close to the pump, the, the phonons don't propagate very much. If we go away from the center of the, from the from the pump and away from the high density region, the solitons or the phonons, I should say, they propagate a lot. And then every time they fall inside the horizon, there is no escaping for them, and they curl around the vortex core. We can have them nicely curling around the horizon and then escaping as well, which is very good and very much in agreement with the movie which I showed you earlier. So here it is. These are the trajectories of our pairs of solitons on the vortex. We can go back closer to the experiment and run a simulation of, uh, of the experiment. So this is the gross pitevsky equation and I create an animation from steady state images, okay? And uh, I subtract uh, the, the background density in order to have very good contrast. And what we see is again, the same behavior as earlier. When we are close to the vortex core, we have two solitons. They are curling along, along the flow, and one of them is even curling very, very far inside. When we are further away, we have only one soliton, and it's curling. And when we are very, very far, when we are close to where the, the pump would be, where the donut would be of high density, we have no soliton. So we can simulate uh, numerically something that agrees with the experiment, and the trajectories which we see for the soliton that curl around the vortex core agrees very well with our analytical trajectories. So that's nice, because it means that we basically understand almost everything. Here is a comparison for you between this intri these intriguing uh, hydrodynamics, which I showed in the beginning, with our uh, two, one, and zero soliton uh, regimes, the corresponding simulations for you uh, to see really the continuation of the, of the density dip. Here, of course, on the picture, we cannot see it because the experiment is not clean enough yet, and because we have a lot of chaos in the center of our beam. But um, if we were able to see, we would see that nice curling, which is again described by our analytical calculation. So what do we learn here really? That the behavior of our, um, uh, of our falling solitons really corresponds to the trajectories of so-called phonons that set off along the chunk of code. I mean, of course, we, can, we could calculate their trajectories a bit better, but Basically, the description of the Cherenkov cone suffices to capture the physics. But that doesn't explain us, explain to us why sometimes we have one soliton and sometimes we have two solitons. In fact, the, the explanation is very simple. Here on the edge, okay, here on the edge, we have the pump, and the pump sets the phase. So where our solitons are emitted close to the pump, they cannot create a pi phase shift because the pump sets the phase. Further away, they can create a pi phase shift. You have two minutes. Okay, I'm just on time. So basically you can understand the zero, one, two soliton behavior from the distance to the high density in the pump. And we can understand the trajectory of the solitons on the vortex flow from the trajectory of phonons on the rotating space time. So analog gravity here really helps us. And we can go much further. For example, at the moment, I'm considering a dispersion system. Of course, there is dispersion in all, in all analog systems, so it would be nice to include dispersion here. And another thing is that uh, once we do that and we describe the trajectory of our uh, solitons better, we could use that to probe analog gravity. I mean, there are many things which I haven't said, many small details, and you may ask a lot of questions about this, but basically there is a lot to do already with our solitons. And then, once we've done a lot with our solitons, we can move back to studying uh, really the propagation of waves on our rotating space time, so the propagation of phonons. And then again, there is the role of dispersion. We can also trace better trajectories that tell us about wave packets rather than just particle-like um, trajectories. We can see whether the trajectories of our phonons and of our solitons, they uh, believe, uh, sorry, follow geodesics or whether they are more like uh, particles that we would throw on the rotating space time with some, uh, with some velocity. 
And we could also study rotational superradiance, that would mean uh, 2D correlations. Or we move to something else. Uh, there has been a lot of recent work on, um, on basically analog gravity with vortices in, uh, in superfluids, in both Einstein condensates or in, uh, or in polar atoms. And we could study vortex instabilities. It so happens that uh, if, if the vortex is instable, unstable, it, so, it resembles uh, the instability of black holes. So black hole bombs, for example, or ergo region instabilities. Or we could also study something that's called su uh, Penrose superradiance. In a sense, you can think of that as being uh, the uh, particle analog to the rotational superradiance of waves. And beyond all of that, uh, accessing basically uh, analog via analog gravity, accessing the um, instability of the vortex, the, the propagation of waves, and the emission of correlated modes on a vortex at the horizon or the Argo surface gives us access further to other effects, which are like back reaction of space time to quantum emission, emission also. OK, so this is a lot. And I'm sure you will have a lot of questions. There is one thing that you could do if you have questions. You could go and read uh, this very recent issue of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society that was published in this year. Uh, following on a meeting that was organized at, in London last year. And uh, in this uh, issue, there is a paper by Elisabeth Jacobino, in which she basically explains how to do analog gravity with polar atoms and sort of explains also what's our strategy in the group to, to do this. And of course, if you have questions, uh, I can answer them now, or you can write me or Alberto or Elisabeth uh, an email, and we will be very happy to, to talk to you. And also, if you have suggestions of what to do with our system and our solutions, we are very, very interested in hearing from theorists what they would do with this system. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, questions, please. Uh, Valery Kozin. Uh, hello. Could you please show the slide where you compare two metrics? The one corresponds to the flow and the one corresponds to the yeah. black hole. My question is, what is the meaning in writing the metrics of the flow? For example, the matrix of the black hole is invariant under the Lorentz transformation, but what is the meaning of the TBT matrix? So basically, what this metric explains is um, how a vortex flow is analogous to a k space time. But how it is analogous? So okay, the so, lower line is preserved so under the Lorentz okay, so transformation. Contrary, contrary to what we can do, for example, in, in, uh, in Jeff's experiment, where we really have a, a very nice isomorphism between the wave equation for sound uh, in, a 1D, in, in, a, in a 1D flow of uh, atomic Bose-Einstein condensate and the wave equation of light on a, on a, on a Schwarzschild black hole, here we can only really study the equatorial slice of the Kerr black hole. And in fact, the two metrics, they are very similar, but they are not exactly the same. And we can see that by uh, looking at uh, how they asymptotically go, asymptotically go to, uh, to infinity. So we are not having a one-to-one -one isomorphism here. However, what we can see in writing uh, the line element of, uh, of our analog space-time is that we have the Argo surface and the event horizon. And basically, that's all there is to, re to read in here. All the rest that uh, has to do with the, the Kerr black hole, the Kerr metric, I think, we don't have. Is the there thank you. I need to stop the discussion. So, sorry, sorry. We are, we are running out of time. So would you mind to try to keep your answers short? Because there are two people more who want to okay. ask the questions. And we yeah. have so just basically, the only point of writing the metric like this is to see that we have an event horizon and an Ergo surface. Thank you. Um, uh, Fabrice? Yeah, it's great that you can uh, simulate this, uh, these black holes, which is general relativity and quantum field theory. But could you simulate your soliton something much simpler, like, I don't know, the twin paradox, something of special relativity, so that we understand to which extent it actually makes simulation of relativistic, general relativistic, and quantum field theory physics? Uh, honestly, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't think so. I think what we do here is really that we apply quantum field theory on Kerr space uh, time. Please keep your answers short. So if you don't know, it's a perfect answer, I think. So, 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 sorry to stop the discussion, but we are running out of time. And uh, we have one more question, uh, Dr. Steinheimer. Okay. Um, okay. 
so my question was, you, you showed this very nice plot of um, the phase, the experimentally measured phase. Yeah. One. Um, can you extract from this the um, flow velocity and then and get a plot of the of the velocity and then also make a plot of the speed of sound and really see the horizons? Find the uh, so as such, not yet, but uh, we actually extract this from the density because we have a clear relationship between the density um, and the sound velocity and from and the phase and the velocity of the fluid. So it needs the two. We need the two of them. Uh -huh. uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, we need to stop the discussion. Thank you very much once more for your nice talk.